Good evening, everybody, and welcome. We'll be starting momentarily. Thank you all for being on time. Okay, Shalom Aleichem. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Hope you're as excited as I am for the start of our graphic design course. <clears throat> it's nice to meet all of you. I'm sorry that we can't meet in person. Fortunately, due to COVID-19, we have to do this course you know, virtually through Zoom. I hope that uh, you're going to enjoy. Of course, our goal is to give you the foundations and the skills to you know, start your journey on into the world of graphic design. Our program, the J, you know, the uh, job map program is a program that's mandated to help people get employable skills and to help them with jobs. And so for those of you that uh, participate in this course, and uh, you know, if you if graphic design is something that you know, really clicks with you and goes well, please reach out to us, of course, towards the end of the course, and we will we'll try to help you look for a company that wants to hire a junior graphic designer. That's our ultimate goal. We'd love to see you take these skills and turn them into a real world <coughs> job. Mirza Shem to bring home a Parnassa. So without further ado, I, um, I'm going to introduce you to our instructor and uh, just to give a few ground rules. And then for the most part, you're not gonna really be seeing me again. Of course, if any of you have comments or questions about the course, Please feel free to reach out to me or, or one of our staff. We have uh, we've been in touch with you by email, so you know how to reach us. Um, please, uh, one of the important things we ask of you: this course is exclusively for those of the, uh, those of you that signed up for the course. And so, please do not share this link with anyone else. That's number one. Number two, please, when you log into Zoom, please log in with your name so that we can see that you attended. Names that we don't recognize, we will have to remove from the class. So please log in with your name. And uh, if you know, again, please don't don't put sometimes we've seen this before people put nicknames, people put whatever, I don't know, whatever, please use your real name so that we know who you are. And we know that you're here. And nobody else that's not supposed to be here is here. Um, so without further ado, I'm our instructor for the for the rest of the course for, is uh, Zev Block. Zev is a very talented designer. <clears throat> He's a graduate of the FIT School of Design, and um, he has a special talent. You know, the goal of our course, again, is to give you the foundations for graphic design. Um, we're going to, you know, again, this is, we're limited. We only have, this is a 36-hour, eight-week course. There's only so much that we could teach you. We want to give you the foundations so that you could grow and build from there. So Zev is going to teach the foundation principles, and he's going to teach you how to use different softwares, and he's going to discuss all of that. Um, for the purposes of the class to flow well, if you have questions for Zev, post them in the Q&A. There's a special Q&A section where your questions will come. Zev will monitor those. Generally, when we do the courses, we like to keep the questions during the class to a minimum, just some basic questions that are a necessity at the time. <clears throat> we do leave time at the end of the class to answer questions generally. That's how the class is. We, we, we do instruction for an hour to an hour and a half, and then we leave time for your Q&A <clears throat> at the end of the class. So that's where we could flow with the class. I'm sure you're going to enjoy Zev. Zev is an excellent instructor, and he's prepared many, many different, um, aside from actual instruction, there's going to be different uh, projects that you're going to work on, and it's going to be a very exciting class. And so without further ado, I pass the baton on to Zev. Please unmute yourself, and um, I'll be here in the background monitor for a while and you all could reach me through email. I wish you much that slach up with enjoy the course. Cool. Uh, thank you, Robert Wardy. Okay, so um, I first wanted to introduce myself a little bit. Um, and before I do that, I wanna say that this is a really cool uh, thing to do for me. It was really uh, interesting to put this course together. I've never done something like this before. And um, kind of we're going to talk about a little bit about like the design process about um, uh, getting better with every version and every draft. And in a lot of ways, this course is like a piece of design for me. So 
uh, like this class is the first version. And then with feedback from you, who would be in a way kind of my clients, um, uh, every class will get better. So the, you know, if you could provide feedback, constructive, if you notice that um, I can, I'm rushing through something or I'm being kind of vague in some area, or you really like something that I did and I may not have realized that that was really effective. Um, please let me know. Uh, and then that's how this will become more, more enjoyable. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I started doing graphic design at 17 and I was self-taught for a long time. I did a lot of stuff on YouTube, asked friends, um, and copied a lot of work and did also a lot of bad work, a lot of bad work. Um, and I will not show that with, share that with any of you. Um, and then I went to, F well, first I, then I interned at a design agency, a two design agencies. I basically did all the dirty work. I like updated flyers, tweaked this, got this thing book cover ready for production or something like that. Um, and then I went to FIT, a Fashion Institute of Technology. Um, it's a college and art school in Manhattan and I studied visual arts there for two years. And since then I have been kind of managing my own clients and building what I hope would become a kind of design business. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, okay. So this class, we're going to be getting into a lot of intro stuff. So a lot of talking, um, and I don't think this is gonna be typical of the rest of the classes. Um, so yeah, if this seems a little bit tedious, um, bear with me and it won't happen again. Um, right, and from the next class onward, like from Thursday night and onward, we're gonna be getting a lot more practical, a lot more nitty gritty. Um, and we're going to talk about what we need to do that at the end of class. Um, so I, I think it's just good. I don't know what Robert, how um, Robert Wardy has been making sure that you know what this, how this class is going to run. So it's going to run from 8 to 10 p.m. Um, Tuesday and Thursday night. And there's not going to be any homework um, because classes are kind of limited and like I'm not going to grade stuff, but there will be projects and classwork. And if you want to send anything to me and get my feedback on it, I'll be very happy to do that. And I think that will be a really uh, valuable um, experience for you to do the work in class, maybe to take it, take it a step further and then send it to me and ask for my feedback. Um, I think that'll be an extremely valuable way. Uh, and that's really a big, like, I feel like a lot of the things that I teach you you can find some way to learn it on your own. But the big value of having a, learning it somewhat in person, even though it's not actually uh, physically in person, is so you can get live feedback, either from me or from your classmates. So that is, I just think you should recognize that as a very uh, valuable thing. Um, I made a Google folder. There is no uh, like, a, like a general folder for the class. There's no explicit purpose for it. I just thought it would be really good um, to have like a, a singular place that I could share things with you and you could, um, I don't know, you can access it like links and resources, references, maybe terms um, that I talk about and uh, you wanted to look over. So I will try to share that with you. I don't know if I can do that now. So I won't, I'll do that later. Um, okay. <clears throat> Let me get this set up. Um, Amazing. Okay. Um, so we're going to be talking about visual design this class. Um, this work? Yes. Okay. So 
first, uh, we're going to cover some terms and definitions, right? So what is design? And I'm sure our relationship to design or graphic design is a very visual, um, it's very visual. So what's the distinction, what's the difference between art and design, right? They're both visual, um, they can both take, they could both involve tons of color or no color, they could be big or small, what's the difference? So the biggest difference is, is that design in general and graphic design specifically, they focus to solve a problem, all right? Um, and we're gonna talk about that, but that's the biggest difference is that design solves a problem. It lives in a context and it works for that uh, context, that situation. And everything needs to be designed. Everything in our environment needs to be designed. Um, uh, and some things are enjoyable to design and some things are not that fun to design and maybe they're invisible and they'll never get recognized, but that doesn't take away from the fact that it was designed um, and it was, give me a second, sorry. And there was a designer or there is a designer involved. Um, so here's an example of, uh, an example of design, right? So we're gonna talk about graphic design in a second, but this is just design in general. So this is uh, a man, his name is Arthur Compton and he was a physicist um, and he was teaching in a college. I actually don't have the date, whoops. Um, but he was teaching in a college and he noticed that cars are driving um, way too quickly past the building that he was teaching in and he was concerned. So he uh, came up with this really economical, cheap, um, uh, like easy to install uh, tool. Um, he designed this tool uh, that would stop people from uh, driving too quickly and he called it the speed bump. Um, and while our experience with the speed bump is kind of like this random log of asphalt across the street, you can see um, in these diagrams that it's really, uh, it was really intentional. It wasn't done by some random, um, I don't know, not, yeah, <laughs> like it, it was it was done with a lot of thought into how it would work and what you would need for it to be effective. And with uh, and it was thinking about the context, like it's going to be on a road and in relation to the road, it's going to be this high off the road. Right. So the speed bump, this is what he designed. Um, so what is visual design? So visual design uh, is the process of communicating and problem solving or solving visual problems through the use of typography, photography, symbols, and illustration. Um, and we create meaning using all of these elements. We create, we communicate messages through all of these elements. So while that piece of asphalt or the speed bump um, was a piece of design, this is a piece of graphic design. Um, this was designed by a person for maximum visibility, uh, irrespective of where it was placed, irrespective of how far or how uh, fast the cars are driving. It was, right, the, the yellow is really unnatural and garish, really sticks out and pops out of any environment you put it in, hopefully. Um, and there's a black line to further separate it, right, further separate it from its environment. Um, so we talk about like the visual elements of things. So a graphic designer, could use a brush and an artist can use a computer. Um, and it's really about the context that uh, the creative work lives in that defines what it is. So um, again, a, a piece of graphic design could be done by hand and a piece of art could be done by a computer, but they're done with different um, goals in mind. And the designer's goal is to solve a problem that usually will live outside of themselves. So um, I'm, we spoke about typography, photography, and, and a couple of other, other elements that make up the tool, the toolkits of visual design. So I want to define that a little bit and um, let's talk about it. So typography is the art of and technique of taking type um, and making written and visual, uh, written language legible and readable and appealing. Um, and so that's like a very dry definition. A lot of these definitions are kind of dry because I wanted to use a very ob objective definition of things. So 
what we see here, this image we see here, is actually a, an engraving almost 2,000 years old. Um, it was, it's at the bottom, it sits at the bottom of a column called Trajan's Column in Rome. And it was built to commemorate uh, the victory of Trajan, who was a Roman emperor. Um, and these were, I guess the photo kind of um, tricks us into, it kind of looks 2D, but uh, looking closer, we could really appreciate the fact that someone sat there with a brush and like painted each letter and then chiseled it out perfectly and they had no erasers. Um, and what's really interesting is that the, the forms of that font or type of that forms of type um, still translate into like a meaningful communication nowadays. Um, so we see two examples of modern uses of that, of the same, um, same type forms um, or, or letters um, that don't feel like they're from 2000 years ago. And that's something we're going to talk about, but it's very interesting how in design, especially our toolkit isn't only like typography and photography and illustration, it's also things that happen, history, and using that to communicate something for our client. So the next thing would be illustration, right? Illustration, just the dry definition, is a decoration, interpretation, or a visual interpretation of an idea or a process. And it's usually done for some like media or poster, flyer, magazines, et cetera. Um, so, Right, that's, I feel like we're kind of familiar with what illustration is, but I wanted to define it clearly. Um, so what we see here is um, branding for uh, Sydney's, uh, Sydney, Australia, the city has like a, I think a whole program of New Year's celebrations um, throughout the city. And they hired this design company called Garbet Design, uh, also from Australia to design like this whole thing that lived across the whole city um, and we can see that illustration is a very big part of how they designed this thing. Another thing um, we talked about is symbols. Um, and designers, and as designers, we use symbols, right? So a symbol is a mark or a character um, used as a conventional uh, representation or, uh, of an object or a process. And this is a fun thing. So that's, that's fairly simple, right? Uh, it's a visual item that represents something else that uh, uh, communicates something else completely. It's right. It's like a shorthand uh, nickname for a process or an item. Um, so we see here, these are called hobos. These are hobo symbols. Um, in the 1870s, there were these workers who would go from town to town without uh, per place of permanent residence and they would just look for day work. Um, but right, they didn't really have a place to call home, a place to, they didn't know who to trust. So they created this kind of dictionary of symbols that would let other hobos know um, like what's happening in this area. Is this place safe? Is there someone who can give us food? Is there someone who can give us a job? Um, and they would scratch this into kind of a very public areas like door frames and, and signposts to let other hobos know uh, what's going on. So I feel like this is kind of a little bit of a fun detour, um, but when you look at foreign languages, um, the meaning of things, kind of the same thing like these hobo symbols, the meaning of things kind of gets stripped back and we start to just appreciate the shapes of things and we start to appreciate just how they communicate visually. And I think that if we were able to, we could all go around and talk about like, oh, this sign could, this poster could be about this, or this poster could be about that. I think it's very interesting and a good exercise for you to, um, for you to do. Here's another example. Um, besides in 1962 and really large, we don't really understand anything else. It's gibberish. It's I'm in Russian, I believe. Um, and so this also helps us to appreciate just the way things are organized, uh, the use of color uh, and the use of, the use of size to um, give a sense of like what's going on here, what could possibly be going on here. Um, and in a lot of ways, these two uh, uh, kind of graphics um, work like these hobo signs in which we don't know what they mean but we could try to uh, interpret what they mean on our own. 
Okay, so a whole bunch of fun stuff about what visual design is and the different tools of a visual designer, but what, how do visual designers use those tools in a real world scenario? Okay, so the first thing, um, which we probably are kind of familiar with in different capacities is branding or brand design. Um, and there are kind of two elements to this and we're gonna talk about uh, the visual side, but there's also a strategic side. Uh, you could be a brand strategist, which means you don't actually do any real design um, like you don't necessarily sit down and like draw stuff, but uh, it's more about market market placement and positioning. So we're going to talk about the visual uh, part of positioning for a company. Um, so branding is the is a, an idea of taking um, like logos and colors and naming and des uh, and symbols uh, and creating a code, creating a language that will creating a code and creating a language that will communicate the brand's positioning, communicate to the brand's target customers what the brand's position is. Um, and what these are like three snapshots from the rebranding of Uber um, by a design agency called Wolf Olins. Uh, and why did they rebrand, right? It wasn't just random. It wasn't just because they had money rolling around. It was because they were under new leadership. Their previous leader, the person who had launched the company and taken it to a certain point of success um, was getting a lot of flack from shareholders and they said they wanted a new leader in place. So he was out and they had a new leader and the company wanted to show to their shareholders and to the general public, oh, we're under new management, right? So they wanted to change everything um, about the company. Well, not everything, but they wanted to change like uh, a significant portion of, of what the company looked like. In addition, they wanted to move from a company launched in San Francisco to like a global national um, mobility company. And that also meant that the whole brand had to be able to work in different languages, in different countries, in different scenarios. So that's branding. Um, I think this would be kind of fun to show. Open this. I'll do this really quickly. So this is a um, this is a website dedicated to the brand of Uber. <clears throat> so it's not their official website. It's a website where um, you can read about how they like why they changed um, and what was important to them about the change. And I think I, I want to link this out to you if you want to look at it yourself. Um, cool. Boom. Right. And now they have, um, you could download their logo, the construction of the logo. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's a language, right? It's a real, real language. Uh, we could jump to iconography, um, like custom set of, uh, little icons they use for their apps. Um, this is amazing. They made a font for their brand. Um, so that was like a little snippet of what branding can consist of. Okay, so another element where uh, visual designers can apply their craft is editorial design, um, which is really designing for newspapers, magazines, and books. And the idea of editorial design is really to make something desirable. Um, to make someone want to pick it up and then have them read the whole thing. Um, and this specific magazine was done by art director or a graphic designer named Matt Willie. Um, and in addition to this, he was the, um, the, the art director, like the head graphic designer of the New York Times magazine for 15 years. Um, so he has a lot of experience designing these things and making them um, appealing. So this is advertising design. It's kind of niche. It's a little specific. Um, <clears throat> so advertising design is using kind of market strat marketing strategy and using it for design purposes. And a designer who knows both of those things can be an advertising uh, or someone who design ads, designs ads specifically. Uh, what we see here, and you might be familiar with it, um, was, I think it was like last year or two years ago, 
Um, Casper Mattress has ran this campaign on the train that was very different than most ads um, because there was, the, there was like this visual puzzle going on, right? And the reason why they did that, the reason why they did these really like convoluted, really complex um, uh, picture finds on the train is because they thought like, how can we make an ad that will benefit the person sitting on the train? How can we make an ad that will um, kind of bring value to the, to the commuter on the train? And so they designed this. Um, kind of going away from the regular um, template of ads, which is buy my product or like, hey, we're cool or hey, want to be cool, buy my product. Um, so this is advertising design. Then uh, this is uh, UI or user interface design. It's a very broad category and it kind of gets mi mixed, uh, mixed in with other terms. Um, uh, but specifically, uh, user interface design means the design of digital interfaces, um, I, right? Like it doesn't, the title doesn't really give it away, but that's what it means. Uh, it could be like website design or app design or, you know, in a few years from now, augmented reality design. Um, it's, it's taking the tools of visual design and then applying it within specific technological um, guidelines or standards. <clears throat> what we see here is um, a website done by Google or a designer at Google named Ellie Block, who's not related to me at all. Uh, and he took, he did this uh, website, like a kind of an editorial website, right? That he takes a bunch of, bunch of information and um, formats it in a way that's very interesting to look at um, for Black History Month. And um, it's done through Google. So it's a bunch of search searches done, uh, prominent people who were, searched on Google uh, and kind of put together in a website uh, honoring these people. Then we have something like packaging design, um, which is also kind of self-explanatory, but all of these things, uh, all of these different um, industries that we're mentioning, um, the reason why you'd want to specialize is because over time you gain expertise within the constraints of that industry. So with packaging design, right, you're dealing with a very physical material. You have to think about how the design will work around the whole thing. You have to, uh, the, the whole product, you have to think about how the design will work inside of it, the different materials available. Um, specifically, this project um, was, this was new packaging done for a pastry brand in Belgium. Um, and they used, they referenced like very quirky um, custom illustrations and uh, custom font to give over the story of the brand. Um, I'm not perfectly sure. I don't really remember exactly what that was but it's a very cool project and it looks really good and uh, pleasing. Um, and finally, uh, this is signage. Signage design is take packaging design and then like think about it on a very realistic scale on a one-to-one -one ratio. So this, for example, this was the signage, some of the signage done for Nike's main campus, I believe in Portland by a design company called Pentagram. Um, and with signage design, you really have to think about how will it look when I'm right, right up next to it? How will it look when I'm 50 feet away from it? How will it look in the rain? How will it look in the, in the snow? Um, uh, so that's a very interesting form of design, kind of fits together with maybe like engineering or architecture a little bit, because uh, you have to understand, again, the use of materials and you have to be able to, um, you have to be able to communicate with um, manufacturers directly. Okay, <laughs> I think I feel like I, I rushed through that a little bit. Um, so I built this course around, um, I did research on like LinkedIn and other job posting um, websites. And I just wanted to see what were, uh, what was like the industry asking of a junior designer? Um, and I'll be honest, they're asking for a lot because if a company has their pick of kind of um, employees, they're going to pick the person who has like, who's the most capable. And so they always ask for like, they ask for a lot, but they had some consistent themes that I think uh, we could talk, we could learn in this class. And definitely you will be able to build on that um, and develop um, uh, the skills necessary to apply for these jobs. Um, Okay, so 
let's start with no good. No good, uh, this one uh, over here, um, is a, it's a small marketing company. Um, they do like e digital marketing for e-commerce, right? So this is just a screenshot. I was thinking of reading through the whole thing and then I realized that that would take me too long. So I took a screenshot of it and I pulled out the three um, main things that I think were relevant to what we could do within, like, within the scope of this course. So the first is a proficiency or being really good at a program called Sketch, Adobe Creative Suite, which specifically Adobe programs, they, they specify Photoshop, Illustrator and InDesign. Uh, they say that you should have superb design typography and layout skills, um, ability to take a design and format it into a variety of portions. I think what they mean is a variety of formats, phrased oddly, uh, and then understand the different resolution dimension and various graphic file formats, meaning that they're gonna need you to take a design and scale it from an Instagram post to an email to a website banner. Um, so this is like a small company. Next, we have Vineyard Vines, which is more like a mid-sized company. They're a private uh, clothing. Um, what does it say here? Uh, yeah, clothing retailer. Um, so they are, what, what were they looking for? They were looking for an advanced knowledge in Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Acrobat, Word, Excel, Adobe Creative Suite. Um, they're looking for strong skills in typography and layout, uh, and they need you to be able to, uh, to, uh, to follow the brand guidelines, have a strong sense of brand attributes as it applies to color, product knowledge, and other lifestyle elements. Um, so what that means and what they're looking for is, so you see the, the same programs being mentioned again, um, strong design skills, typography, and layout skills. And then they also want you to be able to contribute to their brand. Um, and we're gonna talk about that. It's, it's um, something we could go into in depth. Um, and finally, this is the New York Times. This is a wire cutters is like a sub company of New York Times that do product reviews for products. Um, and the software they ask you to know is Sketch, Adobe Suite, Adobe Creative Suite, we mentioned that before, exceptional skills in the formal aspects of design, including typography, composition, form, hierarchy, proportion, and color. Um, and they need you to be able to maintain and develop brand style guides and templates to the point that it will be able to be used by designers and non-designers alike. So again, there's this emphasis on being able to understand uh, and build um, sophisticated brand systems. Um, and Right, so the, the idea that they really want you to be able to do is to kind of learn, let's say wire cutters, they have a brand and it's kind of their own language and they want you to be able to learn that language and then communicate with it. They want you to be able to first um, become fluent in their language and then be able to push it forward and uh, use it in more complex fashions. So <clears throat> based on all that, there are kind of three takeaways that I, uh, understood from these three job postings. And I brought, mentioned these to be specifically because one was like a really small company and a startup. One was more like a mid-sized company and small, and one was part of the New York Times Magazine family and probably very large or uh, very established. So the looking for, um, a, looking that for an ability to be good at Sketch, Adobe Creative Suite, and specifically Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign. Um, so let's talk about Sketch just for a second. Sketch is a prototyping software. When you design for digital interfaces uh, like web and apps, you, they, their software specifically built for designing with those um, kind of in, uh, in that medium. And uh, they're called prototyping software, which means that you're able to design a real life um, interactive version of an app or a website before coding it, before actually building it out. And that saves a lot of time uh, on the developing side of things. Um, so they're basically asking you to know a prototyping software and they specify Sketch, but um, I'll explain what I had in mind in a second. 
Um, so they want you to be able to maintain and develop brand style guides and templates and have exceptional skills in the formal aspects of design, including typography, composition, form, hierarchy, proportion, and color. So all the basic tools of a visual designer. So what we will be covering um, is, what we'll be covering is using a program called Figma. I believe it's still free for three projects. Um, I say I believe because I thought that Adobe Illustrator was available for a 14 day trial. Turns out it's only available for a seven day trial. I was wrong in that I think Susan specified uh, or pointed out that uh, it had changed. So I hope this is still true. We're gonna be using Figma later on in this course, the prototyping software. We're gonna be learning Adobe Illustrator specifically. Um, the reason why is because I don't want you downloading three different apps and paying for them individually, unless you did, which is great, or you have it already. But if you're doing it specifically for this course, I think we can learn a lot of the fundamentals in Adobe Illustrator. And I also think that being good at one program is really important. So you could kind of be mediocre at a bunch of programs and maybe there's an argument saying that that's good. Um, but I think that we um, should focus on a single program and be comfortable with it. And more importantly, be comfortable kind of applying our creative process to it. Okay. Um, so the next thing is uh, brand, uh, maintaining and developing brand style guides. So this means that what I would like to do is get into um, designing a brand identity or ex kind of exploring that space. And um, okay, because I don't have much else to say in that area. We're gonna be focusing on that. And I definitely wanna show you more examples of what a brand identity looks like. Um, curious if I'm able to do that right now. Maybe um, after, just after this part, I think we should look through the uh, brand um, for Uber one more time to understand what a brand style guide looks like. And then finally, we're gonna focus on the skills of typography, composition, form, hierarchy, proportion, and color. And these are gonna be the basic things um, that we are going to work on. And these are kind of the foundations for any part of any of the uh, visual design um, industries or categories that we uh, spoke about before or that I showed you before. Um, Okay, so I wanted to share uh, my design process. Um, I wanted to share what works for me um, and kind of what I put together. And it's a lot more intuitive. I the, the, uh, this process is a lot more intuitive for me at this point, but I've always, definitely when I started out, I was like looking for formulas and steps that I could follow and templates um, that could remove some of the guesswork and some of the thinking from the process so that I could um, kind of uh, follow along and feel what it's like to uh, design something from beginning to end. And this is the, like the process of design I feel is the most important like that's really the difference between art and design um, is we have to uh, first understand the, uh, the context and the situation. Um, and then we have to, spacing out, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, we have to understand the client and the situation and then every single step of a design process, we have to make sure that our design meets those expectations. Um, so, Right, and this really uh, decides the distinction between art and design. Um, and really understanding what kind of solution your client will need is very important to the design process. Um, so this is a process that I built. 
and I want, I would like uh, you to, I guess, have an open mind that you will probably uh, have your own way of doing things that feel comfortable for you. Um, so let's talk about this. Okay, so the first step um, is collect, uh, or I call it collect. Uh, first, we talk to the client, um, and I'm gonna speak as if there is a client, uh, because design doesn't necessarily mean that there is a real life client you can work with, but there is always questions that have to be asked first. Um, so even if you're doing a side project or you're doing your own rebranding or you're making a flyer for, I don't know, a, a band or a musician that you like and they didn't necessarily hire you. So it's just like a, it's a passion project. There are still questions you can ask about um, who's the audience? Um, what's the style of the music of the band? Um, where will a poster like this live? Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that the client isn't necessarily always going to be a real person. Um, but there is always a ton of questions that you're going to ask in the beginning um, that will kind of define the parameters of your project. Um, So when I talk to a client, I have a template of questions that I like to ask and I won't necessarily show it to them. I'll kind of fill it out as I'm talking to them. Um, and I make sure to ask questions that are in addition, not only from my template, but also like specific to what the client needs. Um, and the, this whole like kind of this collect or uh, this collect phase fits together in something called a creative brief. Um, and a creative brief ensures that all messages, uh, that all work, all the creative work that we do is on brand. Oh, and a creative brief is like one to two pages. Uh, and it's very short. It's like a text-based document, very, very simple. Um, but here is a couple of the valuable points of having a creative brief for every project that you work on. So it makes sure that all your messages are on brand. Um, it gives you a broad understanding of the, of the business, of the brand, of the product, um, of the problem space, meaning the area in which your design will address and live in. Um, it could give you inspiration and like a starting point um, for ideas. And it also uh, allows you to hand off um, let's say you wanted to include um, another designer in this process, or let's say you wanted to include another creative person in this project. Um, it allows you to give them a document that will give them a quick understanding of, of the business, the brand and, and its background. Um, also, uh, if you are working with the real life client, a creative brief will reduce the conflict between you and the client that might arise just from basic uh, communication our errors in communication. So it just makes sure that you guys are literally on the same page by having all the details of the project uh, explicitly spelled out. Um, and then finally, it allows you to align your client's expect expectations um, with what you could do. So overall, a very useful tool. Um, so finally, is that the creative brief should only include information that can, um, that would inspire a solution. And I wanna show you an example of a, of a creative brief. Um, okay. That's really small. Okay, so this is, I think this is more like a creative brief for a, uh, for an ad campaign. So there are going to be some things that don't really fit um, with like a general creative project. Um, so first we have a, a brand statement. Um, this is what the company called Hush Puppies, I think they sell really comfortable and expensive shoes. Um, 
This is a background about the company, what they're all about, right? Uh, their history, um, then their target audience. This is, uh, yeah, we're not gonna get into the target audience. It's kind of difficult to nail down sometimes, um, but usually will come from a point of data. The client will usually have insight into who their target audience is. And let's say this is a side project for you. You are gonna kind of have to make up with it uh, target audiences, but it could be fueled by insight, or maybe you will go to, I don't know, the, biz the Facebook page of the business and see who follows that page and kind of um, create an assumption about who the target audience is. Um, the goal, let's say, let's replace advertising goal with uh, objective of, um, of this project. Um, and then these are some of the things specifically to advertising, but kind of carry over to any design project is capturing the tone of, of the brand if, if the, there's a brand that already exists. Um, and I think specifically competition, understanding um, the space outside of the space around, excuse me, the space uh, that let's say Hush Puppies lives in. There's a bunch of different companies that in the mind of the consumer, um, uh, Hush Puppies lives next to these other companies and these other products. Um, and then finally, like the client says, like, hey, we have to have, like the logo has to be in the final design, uh, yada, yada. Okay. Um, so one tool that I use um, specifically in like the collect phase of the design process is called the golden circle. And I'm not sure if you are familiar with Simon Sinek, who's a speaker. Uh, I think he worked in advertising first, but the golden circle um, is this kind of visual tool to capture a bunch of different, uh, informa different information about the client and then prioritize it with regards to how important it is to the emotional core of, let's say the project or the business. I understand that some of these things may not translate perfectly into like a flyer, um, but I think it's probably interesting to kind of see uh, my process. So we start with, well, first there's an assumption, right? First is an assumption that at the end of the day, human beings are emotional. Um, and that what we do are, is driven um, by some kind of emotion that we may not be aware of. And we also assume that businesses and organizations have a similar um, organiz organization construction, uh, right? So they have the thing that they do, but then they have the purpose that they do it. Uh, and um, so that's kind of really important because as designers or visual designers, a lot of times we're gonna be dealing with emotion. We're gonna be dealing with tapping into people's wiring and trying to get them to do something or trying to get them to feel something. Um, and this kind of starts by identifying the emotional kind of engine behind a company, behind an organization, behind a product. So, Starting from the outside, we have like that what the outside circle is the what. So we don't have to get too specific with that. Uh, I don't get too specific with that. I just talk about like, what is the, what, what do you do? What do you offer? What's your service? Um, then I go into the how and specifically the how uh, is kind of trying to understand the process, their, the way they communicate. Um, uh, and their how is the most important thing to know is the what's the thing that makes them stick out? What part of their process or about the company? What part about, like, what is it, um, sorry, what is it in the way that they do things that makes them stand out? Um, and finally, uh, it's the why. And the why is like the most important. And uh, sometimes, like, I heard someone say that the why is like, should not be the smallest circle. It should like work the other way in where like the what should be the smallest and the why should be on the out, outside. Um, but the why is the most important because let's say a client says, oh, you know, we sell like products on Amazon. It's like, okay, great. And like, why do you do that? And uh, people will provide a very easy answer 
Um, maybe it's kind of cliche, maybe it's kind of um, insincere and it's important to kind of dig in and like, no, tell me, tell me why, you know, it kind of play the why game that maybe little kids can play, which is like, just ask why and why and why until you get to some kind of a unique response that kind of stands out. Um, and once we have all of those answers, we have to start, um, we have to really understand our audience. And we spoke about a, a target audience. A target audience, right, is like, who are you trying to appeal to besides just the client? Who is your client trying to appeal to? Who's like that wide based community um, that you're trying to appeal to? Like, for example, for this course, um, I spoke to Robert Wordy and asked him, like, where are you going to be advertising? Because I wanted to understand what kind of people are going to be joining the course. Um, and he told me, like, you know, WhatsApp and posting, uh, like, posting ads on different websites and email blasts. And that gave me an idea about who would be participating. <clears throat> Um, so, and, and, and so now taking uh, a break from an example related to me, but when you want to understand your client's uh, target audience, you don't only want to know like who they are, like men or women from 20 to 30. You want to know like, what do they care about? What brands do they frequent? What don't they care about? What do they hate? What do they love? Um, and that is, uh, those answers will be very important in understanding like what kind of um, visuals are appropriate. Um, <clears throat> is there any outstanding questions? No. Okay. Um, research. So finally, like after doing all that talking with the client and trying to get as much as you can from them, um, we do uh, research, we conduct research based on the client's industry, the company name, uh, the history, uh, the competitors, visual trends, uh, and the target audience that the client may not have included. Uh, and I look at like Wikipedia, I'll go on like Facebook pages, um, Google images, um, I'll go on the company's about page on their website. And I'm trying to get as much information as I can that exists in the real world. Because a lot of times, while clients have like a really good understanding of their business, they also have a kind of biased understanding of their business. Um, and so they're going to give me enough information um, that they look good. But it's also important to look into what kind of reviews, like what are the reviews saying about the company? Um, and I might even look on like Medium to see articles about the space. Maybe it's not about the business. Maybe I'm like make, doing a project on um, what, I don't know, premium chocolate. And it's like, what kind of articles are there about premium chocolate? What, what are the experts saying about medium chocolate? Um, so, so just, um, I would like to take a two minute break in two minutes um, and I think I've been speaking for a long time. I think that this is kind of hard to sit through. So in two minutes, well, not a two minute break. Okay. <laughs> in a few minutes, I would like to take a break uh, and then we can all come back and maybe um, something under 10 minutes and we'll continue. Um, so first, uh, just one more point is we come to uh, choosing. Actually, I think this is good to stop here because then we're going on to the next section. So um, are we okay to take a 10 minute break and we'll continue on, what just happened? We'll continue on to the, um, the next section. So I guess 9.02. No, 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 Zev, I, I don't, I don't, I, uh... Yeah. I actually don't. I don't think it's a good idea to take a 10 minute break. Isn't part of today's class to show people how to download the software? Yes. Maybe uh, instead of doing a break, just do the walk them through that. Now you've been, you're an hour in now. Okay. It's very important for the next class. This is it's interactive. Don't, uh, don't, okay. don't think you should walk away. Like, oh, you could do a one minute, just like a breather, but let's do the download now. Let's do it. Um, First, I'm going to make sure that I'm logged out. It is fairly simple, but 
Let's do it. Boss has spoken. All right. Okay, so um, can I move this? Okay, so I'm gonna go to adobe.com. Um, amazing, right? So they're offering some discount. This discount really only applies if you have a academic, like a dot college, like um, I have a school email, um, but you won't be able to get a student discount from this course. So we go here, um, creativity and design. We go to Illustrator. Um, okay. Um, and okay, so Adobe Illustrator, this is it. There is no other version or other company that provides this. Um, if we click on the free trial if you want to seven days free, and then it's $20 a month. So I thought it was 14. Either I was wrong the whole time or it changed. Um, this is specific, oh, I'm sorry. This is specifically for students and teachers. They're going to ask, you're gonna to have to have a, a school email. So if you just get, um, you're gonna to have to go to individual um, and then illustrator and $21 a month. So let's click that. I don't know, I don't know how to do this because I already have it. Um, you put in your email. Um, okay. Ooh. Let me move this. Okay. And yeah, I already have an account with them. So how would I do this? Um, well, let's see, are there any questions about this? Are people doing this right now? Or you work in a school, can you get a discount? Okay, someone has a question saying this class was not a download. I'm not sure what that means. Robert Wardy, can you speak to that? No, nope. not here right now. Okay, uh, I'm not sure what that means. You don't have to download anything, but it's- I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know who this person is. You're, first of all, you're not supposed to be an anonymous attendee, whoever you are. I should actually, I had said that before, you have to, re we, only people that registered belong here. So if you registered, Anyone that registered got an email and spoke and we told everybody that you will have to download a software. So I, I assume that you probably are not on this class with permission, whoever you are, Mr. Anonymous attendee. I'm gonna ask you actually to log out and re-log in. If you did register, please log in with the name you registered as. You do need the software. There's no way you're gonna take this class. This class is not gonna be a lecture. This class is gonna be interactive. You're gonna be using the software so that you could learn hands-on design. So. Yes, that is the goal tonight's class. You're learning <clears throat> how to download the software because next class we're going to be using the software. Right. Um, and on top of that, there, uh, I think what, um, what I wanted to kind of achieve looking at the different uh, roles uh, available is that m the baseline is that companies need you to know these programs. They're not going to hire you to know these programs their their expectation is that you're using the industry standard software um if you find some other way to do it um you might be successful that's not how i did it um and i would i would also just like to point out um for those of you uh, maybe just from some context until a couple of years ago to use this type of software you had to buy it and you had to buy a nice you had to pay a nice amount of money you know, it was a few hundred dollars for, you know, when you down, you actually purchased the program. Uh, you know, almost all companies nowadays have changed their model. 
so that their monthly subscription services, that was actually the beauty of this over here. I mean, we're talking here about $20 for a month. So this course is gonna be two months, you pay $40. And then, and then uh, that's it. You discontinue it, so you're not. You know, you you get the latest version. There's never it never goes out of it never goes out of style. And um, I mean, I mean, if you work in a company, sometimes the companies will have it. You won't have to pay for it on your own. But if you're going to be designing on your own, you're going to want to have this. There's actually um, you know packages instead of right now you're just downloading Illustrator, but you could purchase. You know, I, I personally pay fifty dollars a month. I believe for $55 a month. And that gives me, a, I have the whole entire Adobe suite at my fingertips, which has been, I got, I'm not really a designer, but there's times where I need to tweak around. I need to poke around with certain designs and just, you know, having that, that software at my fingertips at any given time is a tremendous thing. And for those of you that are going to get into design, you're going to want to have the software available to you. So, um, you know, Illustrator is your starting with Illustrator, which is what we're going to start with is going to be your gateway in. There's a certain typical look and feel, like Zev will talk about the whole Adobe soft suite, which is one of the most popular standards softwares that almost every designer uses. They all have a similar look and feel. Once you get the hang of Illustrator, you're going to very easily be able to, you know, move along to some of the other softwares right. that will be needed. So, yes, the goal of tonight's class very much is that you're going to watch uh, from Zev how to do this. It really should be very simple. You just log on to that link. You choose Illustrator. You pay your monthly fee. It gives you a link to download. You should just download it to your computer and voila, you should be able to start using it. It's not supposed to be complicated at all. And um, you know, I just want to emphasize, unfortunately, again, due to COVID-19, we're doing this by Zoom. We're not able to be technical support for you. This should be very simple. I hope that you're going to be able to do this because this is what you need to succeed in this class. Right. Um so uh, someone asked if we could, there's a lot of questions coming in. This is exciting. Okay, so um, first, uh, what is this? <laughs> okay, first, um, I'm not like an IT person at Adobe and I don't have extensive experience troubleshooting with Adobe. I've used Adobe, I've downloaded it, I've paid, paid for it, and that's pretty much as complex as, a, as it gets. I can say that it is, someone says, it says it's $21 a month. Um, right, we're, we're looking at the same screen here. So uh, I'm not privy to any information with regards to the technical end of downloading the program. Um, if we click buy now, uh, I guess it's kind of difficult to replicate um, uh, downloading the software when I already have it. I need to move that. Okay. Um, how about we how about we look at the pricing plan first, just to answer that question. Okay, so if you pay annually, um, it's cheaper. Uh, annual plan. So right, a monthly plan is thirty, basically thirty two dollars. Um, I pay an annual plan. That's why I made that mistake of saying it was 20, 21 and $22. Um, you save money by paying it for the year. And at the end of the day, um, if, you know, using this program on your own, um, getting good at it will, uh, increase your chances of getting employed either, uh, through, um, Yeshua Wordy's program. Uh, and getting a, like a job as a junior designer, or you're gonna take freelance jobs. Um, $200, $300 in design work is not very difficult to drum up. So just your design work will pay for the program and then you'll have a program for a year and it gets updated um, con consistently. You get access to something called Adobe Type Kit, which is like this huge database of, of fonts, of like awesome, awesome fonts uh, that are free for you to use for all your projects. Um, okay, but let's say I want to do a monthly plan. Let's say we don't like that idea. Don't click the Adobe, add Adobe stock, unless you want it, but I did it once by mistake and I had to pay for it. Buy now, just fake emails, okay. Thanks, yes, you actual, let's see if this works. Okay, so we put in a credit card. I'm not sure how I'm going to do this over 
over uh, Zoom. I could stop sharing. Um, is this is this is this something that people are having a hard time with? Because I think that although I really did want to walk through every single step of downloading it, um, I don't think it makes a lot of sense, especially because I would have to. Uh, put in like actual financial information. It's gonna be 32, basically $32 a month. Um, and you could cancel at any time, I believe, if you pay a monthly fee, even if you pay an annual fee, I feel like I'm pretty sure there is a specific um, uh, kind of mar uh, period of time where you can cancel it and get your money back that you haven't spent. Um, Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Are people doing this right now? Um, feel free to put it in the Q&A. Otherwise, we're going to move on. Awesome. Uh, Kal, I don't know if that's the real name, just said um, that according to online sources, which I'm not sure what that is, uh, you can cancel annual subscriptions within 14 days of the initial order. So that basically means that you have 21 days uh, of using the program where you won't have to pay for it. I think that's, that's correct. So that kind of buys to three weeks of time for anybody. And that's really good because starting this Thursday, we're going to be using the program and learning it and be, getting comfortable with it. So, uh, okay. Any more questions? Google, okay. So some people did, uh, I had to research. If you cancel it before 14 days, you'll get a full refund. If you cancel your plan after 14 days, but before the 12 month commitment date, you will be charged 50% of the remaining period. They're also really nice. If you call their, I don't know, if like somehow you end up um, paying for something you don't want to, they're really uh, nice um, about helping you out. Okay, so. Let's get that, I wanna continue. Okay, so we spoke about the whole uh, phase of working with a client or doing your research and defining the parameters of the project. Um, and the next phase is, I call it choose. It's basically, you have a bunch of information. You have words on a page, you have bits of data, you have bits about who's a target audience. Um, how does that come together into something visual? How do you translate that? So the first uh, kind of built, uh, something to remember also is that every one of these stages kind of builds on the previous step. So um, if you do every single step thoroughly, you will have the, I guess like the process will move as you get used to it will move very, very smoothly. Um, <clears throat> so the first phase is choose. Um, and this is basically coming to an agreement with the client about, uh, well, one, for you are going to decide a visual, uh, like the visual direction of the project. And then um, you will, uh, then you show it to the client and you get the client's confirmation on that. So what I do is I use something called a stylescape or some people call it a mood board. And, um, well, there, there is a, something called a mood board and then there's something called a stylescape. Uh, a stylescape is, uh, let's, sorry, let's first talk about a mood board. A mood board is basically a bunch of images um, put together to that reference like the design that you want to do. So if you want to do business, if you're designing a business card for somebody, you will, you know, maybe 12 different images of business cards that you like, and you'll show that to the client. Um, and you will, um, You'd be like, you know, what do you think of these? And they'll be like, oh, I like that part of it. I like that. I like the gold foil. I like that font. I like that texture. Um, 
a stylescape is a lot less about a specific design element. You're not trying to show the client, oh, I will make this for you. You're trying to capture the vibe and you're trying to capture the mood for the client. And this, um, so, okay. Um, and what's kind of important is that a stylescape um, is not, you're not looking for design references um, specifically. You're not looking for like fonts that you will use. You're looking for uh, uh, communicating a vibe. Um, so you're looking for colors, and textures, you're looking for architectural spaces like buildings, um, maybe offices, um, different um, uh, and, and, and objects that, that reference the brand's personality and values. And the whole idea is to create a visual direction um, that will differentiate, um, with, I guess with regards to branding, it will differentiate the brand, um, but it will communicate what you would like to communicate. So this is kind of a close up of a stylescape that I made for a, a branding project. And none of these things here, like even the little box that says fame picks, I wasn't showing that to say, oh, this is what your logo will look like. I was trying to really show like, what if your brand felt like this, like a, a kind of sophisticated, but also uh, a little bit, a little bit young, a little bit, uh, obviously it feels masculine. Um, and that was something I was trying to communicate to him that I was not really the brand. Um, those weren't really the brand, uh, like personality specifically. And this was the first one. I think there was like five other ones that I showed to him, um, uh, each with comments less. So the, the value about stylescapes is that they're not telling you uh, binary yes or no answers. They're telling you, um, give, this feels a little too masculine. This feels a little too dark. This feels a little too young. Um, and they're not really ruling out specific design elements. They're ruling out like a general vibe, a general feeling. And this is also good for you because um, you're still, this is still part of the research process, research process for you. You're taking what you learned from the client or what you learned from your research and you're um, developing it into something that, you're developing it into something that uh, starts to look like something, but you're not designing it uh, because you want to make sure that your understanding of what the client told you or the information from the client is correct. And so sometimes for this, like this, for example, I showed, I showed it to the client and he's like, uh, you kind of got it, but it's kind of off. Uh, it, it doesn't really feel like this is something that I could really communicate and stand behind. This is another example that I did for a, for a musician. And they had this very, like currently they have this very like clean and refined look, but their music was more acoustic and folksy and they wanted something, they wanted to change up their brand. This was not at all what they went with. <laughs> this was like a wild card. Like they, uh, they didn't hate it, they liked it, but they did not actually end up doing anything with this. But here I was referencing like, um, like jazz records and blues records and vintage records. And I was trying to um, kind of uh, go back in history a little bit and show like, hey, you know, like no one looks like this anymore. Like musicians don't look like this anymore. And this feels a lot more like music than the very minimalist, um, simple professional kind of appearance that uh, musicians try to give off. And they kind of liked it. They kind of understood, but I don't know, they just never followed. They never followed through with it. Uh, and this is a final, this is a, an example of me breaking the rules. So I said not to use any design references and I usually don't. Um, specifically with this, it was a client who was on a, in a rush um, they pretty much knew what they wanted. It was a very specific deliverable, um, which is the, this, like a deliverable as in a very specific thing they wanted from me. They wanted some kind of flyer. And so what I wanted to do before I just, um, jumped in and started designing something that I was excited to design, I wanted to first make sure that, 
um, what came to mind was okay with them and felt right with them. So I, in this project specifically, I didn't really go through a whole process of like talking to them, who's your audience, blah, blah, blah. But I did want to uh, like understand, okay, so this is for like, a, um, this is for like an established school. Um, it's kind of a fundraiser. So, um, you know, maybe we're going for something a little elegant, something that feels sophisticated, something that feels established, something that people will be proud to give their money to. Um, but it's also for uh, the, the proceeds of the fundraiser will go to an arts and music program. And so I kind of wanted to include that uh, into, the, uh, into the mood board, into the stylescape. Um, so I'm trying to introduce color and maybe like experimenting with um, the layout of the, the topography but I didn't make any of these things. I just collected it and I presented it to them uh, kind of quickly just to kind of get a feel and uh, feedback for what they were thinking of and what they had in mind. Um, and specifically with this case, they were pretty on board and I referenced a lot of what was on the stylescape. So it was also a point of inspiration for me down to the, uh, the font choices and the color, uh, the color palette. So, did I miss anything? No, okay. So the next thing is, um, okay, so the next phase is the create phase, right? So we have the collect phase. We have the talking to the client, understanding what they're all about, understanding their product and their business and who the target audience is. And then we go into actually designing the stuff. Well, right, and then we have the stylescape, which is also a kind of visual research, right? So you're not only doing, um, uh, informational research, now you're doing research into um, what the, what other businesses look like, et cetera, what stylescapes, what we said, said about stylescapes. And then we go to create. Um, so um, this sketch, I didn't make it very big, but this was an example of like a kind of a passion project that I was doing um, for a, uh, for a co-op, a uh, food co-op. And I did, a, a ton of sketches. And I personally like to do things by hand. Uh, it's something that I'm comfortable with and it also allows me to do anything that I want to. Um, uh, it's a lot more forgiving to use a pen and paper than uh, using a computer. Uh, but even obviously sketching it in the computer is a totally valid way of getting your ideas out there. But I really go um, and do like tons and tons and tons of sketches. I would want to show you an example of um, iterations that I do, like the amount of um, iterations that I do. So, okay, so as I'm waiting for that to load, um, This is an example of what I was working on really recently. I can't talk too much about the client, um, but I found a bunch of logos I felt appropriate for the client. I printed it out um, and then I just started sketching. First, I started sketching what um, I already saw and then I started sketching Okay, so, uh, and then I uh, started sketching like iterations on what I saw and what I found. So I started by copying and then I started by changing it. Um, Hello. Did I freeze? What happened? Um, okay, so let me show you an example of a project. Oh. Forward me what the message is. Let me see what it looks like. Uh, Robert, where do you, we can hear you. Um, okay, so this is an example of like a logo process I did um, and the client needed it yesterday. He's like, oh, 
I have this local project and I just need it done right away. Uh, so I sat down, um, it was like break at my school and I just started uh, iteration, iteration. This was all done on a computer, um, sketching, 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 sketching. Um, and specifically this was for like a luxury watch brand for, did you see? I just want to make sure you see the right screen. Sure. Okay, great. Um, so, and I'm playing with the idea of time and I'm playing a deal with watches and I'm trying to make something feminine and luxury. And yeah, uh, tons and tons of sketches, a lot of very bad ideas. Um, <laughs> at some point the client said like, oh yeah, your logo looks like the Freemasons logo. And that got me worried. Um, and yeah, you can really see uh, that it, I don't know, some very bad ideas, um, but that's the joy of sketching really. Um, and then it develops into like a color, color exploration, um, color palettes, um, taking images like I found on Pinterest and trying to own it and adopt it and seeing if that makes sense for the brand. Um, and then developing some kind of layout and even uh, an Instagram, like social media because oh my gosh my mouse my zoom isn't working that well i'm like what would that look like together um and this is kind of a this is how i do things uh, another example um uh, let me show you one more example of what it looks like to come up with a ton a ton of options for a specific idea. Um, okay. Um, okay, so this was for Leviticus, he's a DJ and uh, the, what happened with this project was that he came to me, he wanted to do a rebranding and I automatically assumed that that included a logo. Um, and I did not ask enough questions. And so I immediately went into the whole exploration of like, oh, like electronic music, what does that look like? And like looking at different electronic music logos um, and really just going all over the place. At some point thinking, oh, maybe he needs an icon, um, going into like abstract shapes. Um, and <laughs> stretching type, uh, I'm laughing because these are really terrible ideas, but no one, or at least the client never saw these as legitimate proposals. Um, and tweaking, 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 and then eventually basically just redoing uh, and cleaning up the logo that he had already. Um, and, you know, I, I guess there's something satisfying about seeing how many things I came up with, um, even though none of it was actually used. Um, and to me, that's kind of a part of the stage that I'm talking about, which is sketching, which is just coming up with hundreds, uh, well, not necessarily hundreds, but a lot, a lot of different options um, that you could, oh my God, that you could, um, kind of draw from and pull the final solution from. Okay, so finally uh, is the commit stage. The commit stage is showing the final design to a client in, in a context, um, maybe um, showing what it looked like, uh, you know, if you're designing a poster, maybe putting it in an area like um, design. We're gonna talk about this a little bit, um, but mocking things up, which basically means um, using a digital um, file to make it look like your poster that you designed in Adobe Illustrator is actually uh, plastered on a wall or something like that. Um, and okay, so the that final stage um, could look like this. So I just showed you um, that watch company, feminine watch company. So this was one of the presentations. Um, for their design and their logo. And it's just like a, a PDF um, that explains like the idea behind the brand, uh, explains 
um, like what the fonts for the brand would look like, the colors of the brand would look like, what the social media posts would look like. I also developed like an illustration style that kind of felt appropriate for the company. Um, and this is typically how I would present things to clients. Um, another example might be right okay so another example might be um this okay another example might be like a pdf like this like this is like a brand guidelines are, but also a brand presentation for the DJ for Leviticus I was talking about, a bit about the brand. Um, I included a mood board because specifically what he was looking for was something that he could share with other creatives, something like we talked about with the creative brief. Um, so these are like font choices, which he did not end up going with, um, and a color system. Uh, and this is what the logo looked like at the end and just how it would look like, a mock-up would look like um, on business cards. Uh, someone raised their hand. I'm curious if they could put that in the question and answer. Okay, someone's having problems with the class. Okay, um, we're gonna deal with question and answer in just um, one minute. Um, okay, so I wanted to close, or I wanted to, uh, not really close, but I wanted to um, talk about this for one second. Okay, so this guy's name is Brian Collins. He's a designer and he runs a company called Collins. Um, and Collins does a whole lot of cool work. They rebranded um, Spotify, they rebranded MailChimp, they rebranded Vitamin Water. Their work is very colorful. Um, it's very, they use illustration, they use typography. Um, and it's a great example of what a good visual design looks like. Um, and I would like to include that in some kind of links, like Google Doc of links for, um, for you guys in the Google folder. And I'll do that shortly. Um, but the reason why I'm showing him is because, uh, or I'm telling you about him is because he has this idea called um, designing the future. Um, and he talks about how we are no longer competing uh, with each other. Um, not necessarily as designers, but even as people, but with the future, right? So entire industries are no longer focusing on uh, how could we look better or seem bigger than the other company, but uh, the, the really the bigger companies are realizing that they actually, they actually have to move faster than the speed of change, um, which means that they have to constantly be changing. And for designers, that means um, that we are not only trying to just learn the new software, but also we're using our thinking um, to, uh, to, to work with and look at what's not just beyond this. And I know this is gonna be a little, uh, a little vague, um, but I, I think this will be useful. Um, so as designers, as visual designers, as, as graphic designers, uh, we live in the future. We take what's happened already and we turn it into something new. And then we hope that, um, you know, if we're designing a flyer, for uh, some concert, we hope that people will show up. Let's say a very uh, simple and specific example. Um, and um, so as designers, we imagine new futures um, and we look to the past to see what similar problems have happened before and how other people have solved them. And we use that as inspiration. Um, but you can't, uh, you can't wait for, so we're, we're using the past and, and history to solve a problem but we can't wait for problems to present themselves to you. Pro I mean, when I say problems, I don't mean like, uh, like I don't know, your roof's leaking. I mean like um, challenges. You can't just wait for challenges to present themselves to you. You have to go out and look for them um, because 
by the time the challenge shows up, now you're caught off guard uh, and on the defense. So uh, I thought that an interesting idea was how COVID uh, came along. Um, we all had like a very specific and, and, and standard way of living. Uh, and then, um, and then out of nowhere, this thing came along that no one expected and um, forced us to live very differently for a short amount of time. Um, and as designers, um, we spend, spend our time asking questions, asking questions, asking questions, sometimes to an actual client and sometimes to, um, I guess, to the world or to ourselves. And we can notice patterns and own those patterns. So what I mean is that not only should we be waiting for someone to knock on our door to give us a challenge, but we should go and challenge ourselves and create our own, create our own creative briefs and our own stylescapes that will push us to um, be better designers. Um, so that was kind of a little bit fluffy. Um, so the next slide really was about setting up Adobe Illustrator, which we kind of did, and it seems like people are still having problems. So I wanted to address that um, and see if I could help with that. Um, Okay. Um, okay, so it seems like someone's having a difficult time uh, and I'm not sure exactly what the issue is. Um, you, seems like you're signing on to Adobe Illustrator and uh, you're missing the whole class getting confirming passcodes. Um, that's really annoying. That sucks. Um, how could we, how could we do with that? Let's stop sharing our screen and let's focus on that right now. Um, does anyone have any problems or questions around Adobe Illustrator that seem to be a big, um, a big like obstacle? I want to make sure that we can, um, hi, Susan, uh, do you have I, I, I have other Adobe programs, not graphic things. And they're asking me to update my thing. Once I started doing that, if I don't respond, they're going to shut me out of my account. So I have to keep going until I'm done. So my account is updated, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what you said. Don't do this because they charge a lot of extra money. I don't know what you were recommending that we do. And basically, okay. I missed everything from when you finished collect until the last five minutes when you were showing that gentleman's picture and saying that he's saying everybody should not be competing. Okay. Everything in between, I don't have. I understand. Okay, that, that sucks that you missed that. Um, and you know, it's really difficult because I don't have a split screen where one half is what I'm working on right. and one half is the Zoom. I have to you know, minimize the Zoom in order to get the whole rest of the computer working. And so I can hear right. you, but I can't necessarily come back to you to type or see what you're showing on the other half of the screen. So if you don't mind, tell me, what was it that you said when we download the Illustrator? What is it that you right. don't want us to do? Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So I'm sorry that I muted you, uh, but <laughs> officially I'm not meant to unmute you, uh, but I, I did want to hear what your issue was. Okay. So um they this is something that i did before is that when i got adobe illustrator they uh, kind of included a package for adobe stock which is a data database of um uh stock images and they give you like a month free or something they give you like a, a, a free trial and then they charge you i never used it so i feel like that's a personal recommendation that you probably 
don't need it if uh, you don't want to use it. Um, and yeah, if you have a question and you put it in the question and answer, I think that'll be uh, the best way to uh, communicate. That way, if you have a question, um, uh, if you have a question, um, everyone can see the answer that I give them. Um, okay. Um, anonymous, I, I don't, I don't know what your question is. Okay. Uh, and P Fleischer, if you could, uh, if you have a question, so you're raising your hand, if you could uh, type it into the question and answer section, that would be terrific. Thank you. Um, okay. So there was an exercise I wanted to do. We could try to do it. Um, and it's really a uh, lo-fi as in it's really, um, it's not very sophisticated considering that we're not doing, um, anything on like a le legitimate program. We're going to be using Google slides, but what I wanted to do is, um, kind of work pretend that we're building a stylescape for a real client. At the end of the day, it's really just gonna be us, so, or yourselves. So let me set that up right now. And then I'll walk through what that'll look like. Um, Okay, so I just uploaded a folder to the general class folder. It's called Waffleonia. Um, and there's a document there called the Creative Brief and I'm gonna walk through right now. I wanna spend the next, um, the next 20 minutes. Um, um, okay, uh, the next 20 minutes, maybe just walking through the exercise uh, and we can close with that. Okay. So Waffleonia is a Belgian waffle uh, shop in, in Pittsburgh where I camped out for uh, a good part of the COVID lockdown. Um, I've never been there, it's not kosher. I don't know what it tastes like. And I don't know what Belgian sugar waffles taste like either. Um, this store kind of stuck out to me because there was like a blue facade, a bright blue facade that really popped out. So I thought that has a really interesting name, but like branding's kind of weak. So um, let's, let me see, I just wanna make sure everyone has access to this. Um, is there a way I can share this? Sorry, guys. Um, I'm not sure how to share the link. Um, the link was included. Um, Rabbi Wordy sent an introductory email um, or I sent out an introductory email through Rabbi Wordy uh, and he included a link to the Google folder. And if you just click it and you can add it to your Google folder, uh, then you have access to it. Um, and maybe I can ask him to resend it after class. So I guess you can have access to the exercise uh, even if you can't get it now. I'm not sure how to get it to you now if you didn't get the email or something like that. So we have Waffleonia, um, it, a product and service. So we talk about the product, right? It's a direct line to Belgium's finest treats, um, sugar waffles, uh, hot chocolate. Uh, the, ba the basic waffle is priced at $3. There are different toppings, et cetera. So what I want, what I'd like you to do um, <clears throat> And, I, and I'll break down exactly how to do this and to do this quickly. So I want you to, to create two stylescapes. Um, one will be for an older customer. So let's say like in their uh, early 40s, 
uh, uh, right, um, on trend, very uh, traditional, safe, and then like more like a younger customer, let's say like a college student age, maybe like, uh, like 19 through 25. Um, uh, and let's say this is their two different customers. And I want you to create a stylescape that um, kind of captures the vibe that would appeal to distinctly to each audience. Um, so better not to have any design references and just look at colors and textures and spaces like, um, like stores. Uh, and here are some places that you can look at. You can look at unsplash.com, which is free stock images. You can Google it and you can use Pinterest. You can use Dribble, which is a, uh, I don't, I think you have to have access to Dribble, question mark. Um, and you could look at like architecture, textile, text, uh, textures, interior design, furniture design, et cetera. Um, okay. Um, what do I want to do? If you go to the Google folder, why can I go? Um, maybe I'll do this for you guys. Okay, so um, I made a copy. Uh, uh, if you go into the folder, you'll see a, a stylescape template, right? Um, and just make a copy of that. Um, and it's totally made up. Okay. Right. So this is a step. You could just go to file, make a copy, entire presentation, uh, and save it in your file. And then these are just images. And I could go to um, Unsplash dot com and let's say I want to do something for a younger audience maybe I think um, I just think like fun office space I don't know maybe that's something I want to reference not really um, I'm not really getting anything <laughs> anything worthwhile with these keywords Maybe this is maybe this is something I wanted to copy, um, and then I can paste it right in there. And this is about ten images. I think this is a cool exercise to kind of realize how you could communicate um, a vibe and a um, and a kind of an aura of um, of a space that you created in your mind using images and obviously is kind of pretend play because um, there's no real client and there's no uh, solid information. Um, and I, at the bottom, I also included some links if you wanted to look at specifically about the company. Um, so someone has, has, someone has a question about what exactly is a stylescape? So a stylescape is a, it's kind of called like a, a mood board on steroids. So if a mood board is just a bunch of images that inspire you and you like it, and, um, a stylescape is a lot more about how do all those images come together to give over a mood and give over a style um, and give over a vibe. So it's not about one specific image, although every image is important, but it's how, how they come together to kind of uh, say, one thing, uh, say a specific uh, idea. Um, and someone asked where my stylescape template is. It's in the folder uh, itself. So um, it's not under images. Um, you go through the general folder, I believe you should see that. Does that make sense? I'm not seeing a ton of questions around that. So I assume that it makes sense. Cool, how's it going? Um, are we trying to do this for a specific place? Yeah, so I included a creative brief. It's, um, it's a, uh, a Belgian waffle place in Pittsburgh. Um, so probably a very distant thing 
uh, from, from your experience, um, but they sell like these very artisanal items. Someone asked where to access the exercise. There's a Google, uh, there's a general class folder that um, was included in the introductory email from Rabbi Wordy. Um, that's where you can find a link to the folder. In the wrong place. This. Weird. Right, someone posted an image, anonymous dragon. Hello, um, we're trying to make a copy of this folder. So you click make copy entire presentation. I don't understand why people can't see it. Um, supposedly anyone should be able to see this. I can put it in the Waffleonia folder specifically. Um, make a copy. Okay, I moved it into the folder specifically. I don't know if that'll work. Okay, someone didn't get the email. I can't talk to that. I don't deal with the emails. Um, Robbie Wardy does. And I think the value of this will really depend on how interested you are in trying to do a good job, right? Because I can't grade this, um, but it's a, also if you Google stylescapes, um, you'll see that it's a thing that large agencies do, not only design like graphic design agencies, but uh, here, what are stylescapes? An article about it. Um, for an example of how we open this image, how a bunch of different elements can go and tell a brand story on a single document. This is more like a brand presentation. And that's tiny. You have to, uh, is that just make sure you choose things that only with only Sneha's image of it? Yes. That's, that's what we're going for. How about this? Um, right, so this is, let's say, a stylescape for a design company. So a lot of type, very clean, um, but they're not focused on specific design elements to focus on giving over a mood. Is that making sense to people? Does anyone have any questions that I could respond to? Participants raise their hand. If people, uh, I would love to respond directly, but I think it would be best if people um, put it in the Q&A. Can we do that? Uh, Rabbi Wardy. Hello? No. All right. Yes, sir. What's that? Um, someone in the chat said they didn't get the email. They didn't get the introductory email. If they registered, they were in the system, they should have gotten the email. Okay. If for some reason they didn't, let them send an email back again to whoever, whichever staff member they were in touch with, and we'll get it for them tomorrow. If not. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, right. So as of now, I don't control the emails. Um, okay, awesome. So I, I, I wanted to close with saying that uh, starting this Thursday, we're going to start using Adobe Illustrator and introduce ourselves to the interface, to the workspace. Um, and today what we spoke about is generally what design is, what visual design is, the tools visual designers use, where they use them, like in what industries they use them. 
Um, and we spoke about the process that I, I, the process that generally seems to be reflected in the industry, um, but I have no way of like confirming that 100%. So I can say that's the process that works for me. Uh, and I would encourage you to also follow a similar process until you are comfortable creating your own. Um, and we also spoke about, um, okay, someone did get the email, okay. Um, and we also spoke about, um, well, that's really what we spoke about. <laughs> we spoke about stylescapes. Um, Robert Wordy, are we good to end now? Is there something you wanted to mention? No, I just, uh, for all of you that were participating tonight, hope you enjoyed. You have our email address if you want to send us any comments. And otherwise, uh, we look forward to seeing you Thursday night at Mirza Shem. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to say um, to everyone that, right, this is the first time for me doing something like this. So uh, any feedback uh, would be really, really helpful and really uh, informative. Um, and I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Tonight. Okay. So we're going to sign off. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Zev. And uh, take care.